I don't like when you tell stories like that, Yara says, trying to get away from Myrna. You sound just like that crazy old woman. Unlike Yara, I'm deeply moved by Myrna's story. I realize that I haven't really been aware of the pain Myrna experienced during my second prison term. My eight years in prison weren't pleasant, but I didn't spend many hours or even many minutes trying to imagine what Myrna was undergoing during the days I spent in cells, exercise yards, or prison workshops. I didn't have any contact whatever with my family until several months after Jan and I were arrested at the steel plant on the day when the Magarna Rising was suppressed. My first visitor was Titus. He told me he hadn't found Jan yet, but was still trying. He also told me Vesna was well and Myrna was pregnant. He didn't tell me Myrna's father had been fired from his bus driving job. I suppose he didn't want to be the carrier of bad news to a prisoner. He did tell me Myrna had acquired a pass to visit me, but was having, quote, trouble with her parents. She could barely find time for them, for Vesna, and for her job. Titus also brought me two books. After Titus's visit, my contact with the outside was completely broken for more than two years. I acquired my own constrained routine, prison acquaintances, interests, and problems. Myrna and Vesna visited me three years after my arrest. Myrna spent a long time telling me she had gotten a pass with Titus's help, but terrible things had happened, and by the time she got a day off work and came to the prison, she was told the forms had changed and she wasn't allowed to visit me. Then Titus was arrested, and Myrna wasn't able to find out what she had to do in it to get the pass she needed. That's why she visited me only after Titus was released. I asked her what terrible things had happened, and she listed them mechanically, almost coldly. But something in her tone gave me the impression that she considered herself responsible for everything she was telling me. She began with Jan's and my disappearance, quote, on the day after we dreamed. Then Jan could no longer be found. Her father died. Her mother got sick. Yara was born. When Myrna completed her list, Vesna uttered her only contribution during that first visit. and consisted of three words. I hate you. It became clear to me that if Myrna blamed herself, Vesna blamed me for everything that had happened. I felt like an extra burden on Myrna's back, a burden she didn't need to carry. I reminded her that during our first walks I had tried to warn her not to marry a, quote, political criminal, because she might find herself bound to a non-person, a human being who would suddenly cease to exist. Myrna started crying, but I continued in the same vein. I urged her to divorce me, and I told her I'd heard divorces were easily procured by wives of political cr criminals. Myrna's eyes filled with anger, bitterness, and resentment. Is that all you have to say to me after three horrible years? She asked me. How dare you even think about divorce? Your return is all I live for, Yarstan. You're all I have left now. You're my brother, my father, my husband, and my only friend. You're everyone I love in the world. If you disappear, I'll die of a broken heart, like my father. Don't talk to me about divorce, Yarstan. Tell me something else. But I didn't have anything else to tell her. I told her, I love you, Myrna, more than I love myself. That's why I don't want you to sacrifice yourself to me. Myrna was crying. Vesna walked away from me with hatred in her eyes. Yara tries to get away from Myrna's lap, but Myrna holds on to her. Neither you nor I have a right to say that old woman was crazy. You were born right after my father died. I got a short leave from work, but I spent all my time with you. I didn't once go to visit my mother, although I knew she needed me. I wanted her to let me know she needed me. You were my excuse for not going to her. The union had given my father a retirement pension after he was fired. Our neighbor, the same one who told me about my father's death, found out she still had a right to that pension, but she had to go to the union building for it. The first time he went with her, but the second time she went alone. She didn't let the neighbor come tell me she wanted me to go with her. She was afraid I'd turn her down. The neighbor couldn't get another day off his job. Titus told me what happened to her when he came to tell me, several days later, that she was in the hospital. He learned what happened from the doorman at the union building. It was a cold, snowy day. The roads were slippery. The old woman confronted the doorman and demanded, quote, her due. The doorman asked her whom she wanted, and she ranted about devils and their agents. She pushed her way past the doorman, but several guards pushed the, quote, crazy woman out of the building. She tried to enter the building a second time, but the guards pushed her so violently she fell and remained where she had fallen. The police took her to the hospital, and a few days later, everyone in the union building knew she was, quote, Sedlak's wife and had a right to the pension she had come to collect. Titus came to tell me she was in the hospital, completely paralyzed. There was nothing they could do for her. That was when I let them bring the, quote, crazy, crazy woman to the spare room in our house. She turned Vesna's heart against me, against Yarostan, eventually against you, Yara. She knew her sickness wasn't brought on by the guards or the snow, but by my love games. She was crazy, Yara screams. I hated her. You're what made her the way she was. You're lying, Yara shouts, trying to pull away from Myrna. 
I hate you when you talk like her. You're trying to do to me what she did to Vesna, but you can't. I won't let you. Vesna would never have killed anyone she left. Neither did you, and neither did I. That old woman lied through her teeth. It was all she was able to do. She was completely loony. Say that once again, Yara, and I'll... Loony! Crazy! She taught Vesna we killed people by loving them, and she killed Vesna by teaching her that. Everything she said was a lie, and everything you're telling me is a lie. I know it is. I played with Julia and Slobodan, and nothing happened to any of us, and nothing is going to happen, ever, and you know it. Why can't you just be yourself instead of turning into that crazy woman? You're hateful when you're like her, and don't think you'll ever stop me from playing love games wherever and whenever I please, because you won't. I'm not Vesna. I was glad when we took the old woman to the shed, outside, where we could neither see nor hear her, and I was overjoyed when she finally croaked. I'm glad she's dead, and so are you. Myrna's face is flushed with anger as she whacks Yara across the face. Yara starts bawling. Myrna rushes to the kitchen and puts our dinner into the oven. She was so happy before I went on my outing, Yara sobs. What happened between her and Yasna? Why did she hit me? She never did that to me before. I don't understand, Yara, I tell her. She's been upset ever since she heard the radio broadcast your friend turned on, and she's been angry ever since this letter came. I point to the letter in which you describe your experiences in Sabina's garage. Yara starts reading your letter. She reads while I set the table and help Myrna bring the food in. She continues reading during the meal. Suddenly she asks me, Is Sabina younger than Sophia? Yes, three or four years younger, I tell her. Yara reads further and says, I wish Vesna were still alive, and I wish that old woman hadn't ever come into our house. Exactly what does that mean, Myrna asks. Yara looks defiantly at Myrna. There's fire in her eyes. It means I'd be Sabina and Vesna would be Sophia. It means Vesna would be different from me. She wouldn't want what I wanted, but she'd still be my friend, and she wouldn't be dead. That's what it means. Myrna drops her fork on the plate and runs to the bedroom. For a moment, Yara pretends indifference and continues reading, but it's obvious she can't concentrate. She walks hesitantly to the bedroom and says from the doorway, I'm sorry. I didn't mean how that sounded. I know you couldn't help bringing your own mother into our house. If you ever become just like her, I'd take you into my house too, but only because you'd once been good to me. I'd hate what you'd become as much as you always hated her. You called her a vampire. I was wrong, Yara. You're the vampire. That's a lie and you know it. You're ten times worse than she was. She never hit me. She didn't pretend to be my friend and then turn against me. You're not just an enemy. You're a traitor. Yara starts to walk away from the bedroom. Myrna shouts, Yara, tell me how you like me. Yara returns to the doorway. When you're yourself. When am I myself? When you're not the old woman. Show me, Yara. Come here next to me. Come on, Yara. That's it. Now lie down. Pretend you're on the mountaintop. Lie still. Pretend we're alone. Now who am I? I don't know yet, but I like you now. There's a long silence. Then Myrna asks, Is this how you like me, Yara? You know I do, Mommy. Who am I now? You're Slobodan and Sabina and Julia and Father, and I love all of you. I showed them. What did you show them? To pretend. There's another silence. Then Yara pleads, You're hurting me, Mommy. Can you pretend to forget what I showed you? No, Mommy, not if you hurt me a thousand times worse. Do you ever pretend to be Vesna? No, Mommy, never, and I hate you when you pretend to be the old woman. But I'm able to pretend that, and so are you. I'll never be Vesna. Pretend hard. There, Vesna, lie still. I'm your father. How does that feel, Vesna? And that. Is this how you like me, Vesna? No, I don't. I'm not Vesna. Why are you so afraid? What happened to you? Do you like it better with Julia? That's right, Mommy. And even better with Slobodan, because then it's more real. Is it more real than Vesna? Yara shouts defiantly, Yes, it's more real than Vesna. Slobodan is alive. Julia is alive. Vesna is dead. Why can't you understand that? Vesna isn't real anymore. I hear a loud whack. Yara shrieks with pain. Let go of me! Myrna shrieks, We killed her! She whacks Yara again. Pretend to understand that we killed her, Yara. She whacks the girl yet again, shrieking, You'll kill the rest of us! I run frantically and hold Myrna's arms back to keep her from hitting Yara yet again. The thought of Myrna's father stopping her mother from swinging the broom flashes through my mind. I take Yara in my arms and rush her out of the room. She goes on shrieking. Her face is an expression of terror. My own face probably expresses a similar terror. I let myself down on the living room couch, pressing Yara to me. She starts trembling and places both of her hands on her burning cheeks. I won't pretend to be Vesna, she sobs. I'm not Vesna. Yara gradually stops trembling and sobbing. She falls asleep in my arms. The poor girl has had a full day since returning from her outing. I carry her to her bed and return to the living room couch. I can't make myself join Myrna in the bedroom. 
I try to sleep, but the few memories I have of Vesna pass through my mind. Vesna was barely two when Jan and I were arrested at the steel plant. I didn't see her again until she was five, when Myrna visited me in prison for the first time. Myrna didn't come again for a long time after that visit, when I urged her to divorce me. She sent Vesna to bring packages of food for me, packages which I was never allowed to keep. Every time Vesna came, she made it perfectly clear to me that she hated me and blamed me for the miserable life they all led. From Vesna, I learned that Myrna's mother had somehow become incapacitated, that she had been moved into our house, and that she continually filled Vesna's head with superstitions and fears. But it wasn't only the old woman who shaped Vesna's development. The whole environment in which she grew up terrorized her. When she was six, Vesna did all the shopping and house cleaning, took care of Yara, and nursed the helpless old woman. Myrna cooked supper when she returned from work, but was too tired to do anything else. On one of her earliest visits, Vesna gave me a fairly clear idea of the quality of her experiences in the world, quote, outside. A few days before her visit, when she was on her way home with a bag of groceries, a group of school children walked by her. One of them shouted, That's Vocek's daughter! Others started chanting, Traitor's daughter, capitalist, foreign spy! Vesna ran from them and was hit by several rocks. One of the, quote, brave young revolutionaries ran after her, pushed her into the snow, and spilled all the groceries. No one defended her. Several adults walked by indifferently. When she got home, the milk was half ice, there was snow in the bread and vegetables, and her hands were frozen. Yet she still told me about the incident without indignation, as if it were perfectly natural that, quote, Vocek's daughter didn't really have the right to share the street with, quote, decent and normal people. Myrna kept Vesna out of school until she was seven, partly to get help with all the work in the house, but mainly for fear of what the school children might do to her. When neighbors reported her, Vesna was enrolled in her school. Her, vi her visits became rare and then stopped altogether. Contrary to Myrna's fears, Vesna wasn't physically assaulted in school. From Vesna's sparse descriptions, I gathered that she became a model, quote, revolutionary pupil. She absorbed everything she was told, like a sponge. Her schooling didn't do away with the superstitions she'd learned from her sick grandmother, but on the contrary reinforced them. She merely learned to call the devils that infested the universe by new names. Now they were shirkers, counter-revolutionaries, hooligans, and foreign agents. The rest of her outlook remained unchanged. About the middle of her first school year, Vesna's visits came to an end. I never saw her again. I had no visitors for several months, and I began to speculate that Myrna had finally decided to divorce me. But then Titus visited me for a second time. He told me that shortly after her last visit to me, Vesna had become ill. He had rushed her to the hospital. She remained in the hospital for several weeks. The doctor said she had a weak heart and advised that she be allowed to rest as much as possible. She recovered despite the fact that she couldn't rest for a minute at our house. Titus brought me Myrna's usual package. That was the only time I was allowed to keep it and share its contents with fellow prisoners. Ever since Vesna had started visiting me, I had gone to the visitor's room with a certain apprehension. I was relieved when I saw Titus there instead of Vesna. I begged Titus to urge Myrna to divorce me. I told him there was no reason for them to go through a hell worse than prison because I had been convicted of political crimes. I had already been in prison for four years and I knew that I'd be there at least four more. I didn't think I would ever see the outside world again. I reminded him that he had once asked me to join him in carrying a project. I had not done very well, but my efforts had caused me to lose my ability to survive, my ability to give another generation the possibility to carry a project. Titus smiled sadly at my request. He told me he would try. For several months, I again had no visitors. I thought, without joy, that Titus had carried out my request. Then Myrna came. It was her second visit. I hadn't seen her in years. She was skinny, her face had wrinkles, she looked twenty years older than I remembered her. In her simple dress and black kerchief, she looked very much like her mother. Titus asked me to marry him, she told me. And you refused, I asked? No, Yarostan, she said angrily. I accepted. I knew it was you who'd asked him to propose to me. He did your bidding ever so meekly and unwillingly, but I threw myself at him. Take me, I told him. I'm yours. At that moment, he backed away from me. He saw what I was. He saw the devil in me. He cast me away. He didn't want the devil around his neck any more than you do. Suddenly, I understood all your talk about divorce. Vesna thinks you're responsible for everything that happened to us, and she's ended up by convincing you. But Vesna doesn't know what I know. Vesna doesn't know that whatever you are arrested for, I shared in greater measure. You told Titus you were a chain around my neck, but he saw that I was a chain around yours. Don't lie to yourself anymore. You know it too. You're all I have left now. You're my father, brother, husband, and friend, and I'll do everything in my power to hold on to you. 
I'll be at the prison gates when they release you, and if they don't release you, I'll find a way to crawl through the prison bars. If it's the devil they want in jail, let them imprison me. It's because of me that my brother disappeared and my father died. Please, Yarostan, share that burden with me. As I listened to Myrna, I concluded she'd been affected by her mother's insanity, but I couldn't keep myself from crying. I realized that for Myrna, my prison cell represented the freedom from life she had to live daily. From that day until a few months before my release, Myrna visited me frequently. Sometimes she brought Yara. She never brought Vesna again. I couldn't hide the fact that I liked Yara much more than I liked Vesna, mainly, I suppose, because Yara seemed to like me. On one visit, when Myrna came with Yara, I asked about Vesna's health. Yara, who was six then and had just started school, answered, Oh, she's well enough, but her skin turns to goose pimples whenever anyone touches her. You're not like that, are you, father? Myrna swept Yara off the ground and shouted, Of course he's not like that, Yara. The three of us have the devil in us. Vesna is a saint, like your grandmother. After which Yara told me, I wouldn't like you if you were a saint. Myrna and Yara visited me together for the last time about a year before my release. Myrna came in her best dress. She had fixed her hair. She seemed healthier than I'd seen her since my arrest, and she looked her own age again. She was beautiful. Yara was as lively as an energetic seven-year-old. Myrna blushed when I walked into the room. She told me she'd learned that prisoners were being released at the end of their scheduled terms, and therefore I would be released in 347 days. Mommy says when you're home, you'll teach me all about things they don't teach in school, Yara said excitedly. Myrna blushed again. I was infected by their happiness. I, too, started to count the days to my release, although I knew that such activity could lead to frustrated hopes and a broken heart. If prisoners were being let out at the end of their terms, I was convinced it was out of pure caprice on the part of the representative apparatus. I continued counting days. That's why I know that for the next 204 days, I received no visitors. I knew something had happened. I speculated that Myrna had found out the rumor did not refer to me and had spent her energy trying to move a cog in the bureaucracy. Yara finally put an end to my speculations. I was shocked by her appearance. She was dressed in a sack far too big from her. There were tears in her eyes and her face had an expression I had seen before, on Vesna's face, and once or twice on Myrna's. It was hatred. They killed Vesna, she told me, concentrating all her hatred on the they. I asked her what had happened, but could learn nothing from her except that Vesna had died in a hospital, and that I was indirectly responsible for her death. Vesna was so afraid, father, so terribly afraid. Afraid of what, I asked? What happened to her? The day we got back from visiting you, Mommy and I were so happy that you'd be back with us, in a year, but Vesna didn't want you to come back, ever, and they took her away and killed her because of that. Who took her away, and why, I asked. Mommy and I tried to stop them, but we couldn't. Two of them held me, and the others took Vesna away from us. I asked impatiently, You tried to stop whom, Yara? What happened to Vesna? Her answer was, They locked her up in that hospital and didn't let her out again. They killed her. You would have stopped them if you'd been home. They paid no attention to Mommy and me. I grew suspicious. Yara, how long was Vesna sick before Mommy called the doctor? Yara suddenly backed away from me. The hatred that had earlier been concentrated on them was now aimed at me. With horror and indignation, she told me, Father, we didn't call the doctor. I became indignant too. Why, Yara? Myrna should have called the doctor when Vesna's illness began. Why didn't she call the doctor? Tears covered Yara's face. She looked at me incredulously, as if I were a monster. You don't understand either, she wailed as she ran from me. My last month and a half in prison was like an extra term. One phase kept going through my mind. Vesna didn't want you to come back, Father. She was so terribly afraid. I remembered, analyzed, and reanalyzed the few contacts I'd had with Vesna. None of them had been happy encounters. Since she was extremely sensitive, she must have been aware of my dislike for her, of the resentment I felt at seeing her and not Myrna in the guest room. That dislike and resentment were somehow responsible for her death, but I didn't understand how. Vesna's heart was apparently too weak to withstand the numerous tasks that fell on her, and I didn't understand why Myrna hadn't called the doctor when Vesna had gotten sick again. I remembered that it had been Titus, and not Myrna, who had taken Vesna to the hospital the first time she'd gotten sick. But I never asked for an explanation. When Myrna finally accompanied me home, after eight years of confinement, I found myself in a worse prison than the one I had left. The joy Myrna and Yara had communicated to me during their first visit a year earlier was gone. It had died with Vesna. Yara was no longer the friend and comrade she had been during her few visits with Myrna. She was cold and distant. Myrna was twenty years older again, tired and resigned. She dragged herself to work in the morning and dragged herself home in the evening, ate, cleaned, and fed her mother, and fell into bed. Her mother was housed in a brick shed next to the house. 
She couldn't move her arms or her legs. All she could do was talk. As soon as I returned, I relieved Myrna of the task of removing the old woman's excrement. I had done similar tasks in prison. Myrna insisted on feeding and washing the old woman herself. Her mother would probably have spat out the food I served her. Yara never entered the shed. I wasn't able to find a job and wasn't terribly eager, eager to look for one. Between my tasks and our meals, I took long, lonely walks. When we were together, we didn't ever talk about the old woman in the shed next to the house, and the subject of Vesna never came up. Eventually, I fall asleep on the living room couch. The following morning, I wake up aching at the hour when I usually wake up to go to the plant, but it's Saturday. I walk to the bedroom and stop in the doorway, horrified. Myrna is still in the position where I left her when I pulled her arms away from Yara. Her eyes are wide open and concentrate on the spot on the ceiling. She looks like her mother did during the weeks after my release, before she died. She looks paralyzed. Myrna, I shout, and I start to tremble. She doesn't stir. I run to Yara's room and shake her. Yara rushes to our bedroom, shrieks the moment she enters, and jumps on top of the bed. Mommy, don't do that, she shouts, shrieking Myrna's arms and shoulders. Beat me all you want, but don't look like that. Then Yara starts to shriek hysterically. Stop it, Mommy. I'll be Vesna. I'll be anyone you want, but stop it. Please. I love you, Mommy. You can be the old woman if you want, but don't make them take you away. Please. Please stop it. I become infected with Yara's hysteria. I start pacing around the bed. We have to do something, Yara. Myrna is sick. I'll go out to look for a doctor. Yara's face takes on the expression of hatred and horror I had seen when she last visited me in prison. She shrieks, No! Then she leaps away from the bed and starts pushing me out of the room. Leave her alone. Go away from here. Yara, what's the matter with you, I shout. Your mother is sick, Yara shrieks. She's not sick. You don't understand anything. You want them to kill her. That's terribly mean, Yara. I love Myrna very much. I want her to get well. Then leave her alone, she shouts. The doctor is going to say she has to go to the hospital, and they'll kill her the way they killed Vesna. Please, Yara. She has to see a doctor. We won't let anyone take her to the hospital. You're lying, she shouts, pushing me toward the outside door. Go for a walk. Visit someone, but leave her alone. Please. You won't stop them from taking her. You wouldn't have stopped them from taking Vesna. Vesna was sick. The doctor should have been called. Vesna wasn't sick, Yara shrieks. Then she calms herself and pleads with me. I don't hate you, father, but you don't understand. You're just like Mr. Zabron and all those horrible doctors. Mommy isn't sick. I know. I'll get Yasna. She'll understand. Maybe Zegnik will, too. Please go away, won't you? She'll get well if you go away. And please don't bring anyone. I'll get everyone I know to stop them from touching her. I've had it enough of this silliness, Yara. I'm going to call. Then go to hell, she shrieks, pushing me and beating me with her fists. Get out of here and stay out at least until tonight. Mommy isn't sick. Then what's wrong with her? Nothing, she shouts. Nothing's wrong with her. She's playing with you and me. But you don't know how to play. You're, you're the one who's sick, like all those others. Please, Father, don't have her killed for playing. I leave the house reluctantly. I go to hot coffee houses to try to think clearly, but nothing becomes clear to me. Yara understands Myrna, especially her games, much better than I do. On the other hand, I suspect that Yara's opinion of doctors and hospitals might be a bit of, quote, wisdom she picked up from Myrna and her mother. I convince myself that neither a game nor Yara's opinion of doctors should endanger Myrna's health. I take a bus to the city hospital. My first encounter with the hospital reception forces me to admit that whatever Myrna and Yara think of hospitals, it is based on something real. I've never been to a hospital before. I've also never visited a prison as an outsider. I imagine the reception offices of both must be very similar. Can she walk? Is it critical? A hospital, a hospital doctor cannot visit your house. Would you like us to send an ambulance with a stretcher? No? In that case, you'll have to bring her here by taxi. I make up my mind to find someone to help me take Myrna to the hospital, someone Yara trusts. I walk to Zednik's house, but he's not home. I consider Titus, but the thought of Yara's hysteria dissuades me from looking him up. I take a bus to Yasna's house, but she's not home either. I know I can carry Myrna to the taxi myself, and I realize I am looking for someone who will not only convince Yara of Myrna's need for some medical attention, but also help me decide to oppose Yara's will. I walk to Yara's school and sit down on a bench in the playground. I try to take Yara seriously. I try to figure out the nature of the game Myrna is playing. But surely a person who is seriously injured or paralyzed in a game needs medical care. It's already mid-afternoon. I leave the schoolyard and head home, determined to get Myrna to a doctor, with or without Yara's approval. The moment I enter the house, Yara plants herself in the bedroom doorway. Zednik and Yasna are both in the living room. Have you been here all day, I ask? I went to both your houses to look for you. Yara came to get us as soon as you left this morning, Yasna tells me. Calm down, won't you? Did you contact anyone? How is she, I ask. Myrna is perfectly all right, Yasna says, with an insistent that makes me sense she's lying. It's you who worries us, Yara stand. 
Me, I shout. Are you in on that game too, Yasna? Are you playing with Myrna's health, with her life? I take two quick steps to the bedroom doorway. Yara, step out of my way. But it's Zednik who stops me. He pulls me towards the couch and forces me down on it, commanding, Stay out of there. If you have any love for her, Yarastan, stay seated and listen to us. She needs a doctor, I shout. Can't you see she's sick? Yasna says calmly, I'm amazed at how cruelly you disregard Yara. She's not an idiot, you know. It's not a question of insulting or not insulting Yara, I shout impatiently as I writhe frustratedly in Zednik's grip. It may be a question of Myrna's life. Have you both gone crazy? Are you going to sit here and hold me while she dies like her mother? If you're just going to shout, Yarostan, it would be better if you took another walk, Yasna says. Come back when you're in a mood to listen to us. I should have had them send the ambulance, I shout. I'll go, Yasna. I'll go get the ambulance. Zednik shouts, you'll stay right there and listen to us, no matter what mood you're in. It took Yara less than half an hour to explain the whole thing to me. Why are you so mule-headed? Because I love her, I mutter weakly. Zednik shakes me. Listen to me. Myrna is convinced she's causing a terrible burden. She thinks she's responsible for all the deaths in her family, including her own daughters. Yara starts to close the door of the bedroom, but Zednik shouts, Leave it open, Yara. She has to listen too, and I don't want to say it all twice. She's convinced that death stalks every one of her happy moments. That stupid broadcast about the troop movements convinced her she was right, and that letter from your friend gave her some mysterious insights into the origins of her guilt. She seems to think she was driven to do everything she did, and last night she apparently convinced herself that Yara was an agent of whatever it was that drove her. Myrna's sickness is nothing but an attempt to destroy Yara's carefree love of life. She's determined to drive guilt into the child, and she's apparently willing to die trying because she's as mule-headed as you are. I tell Zednik, I don't understand a single word. But that's a lie. The shed in which Myrna and Yara had isolated the old woman flashes through my mind. Yara's visit after Vesna's death and her admission. Father, we didn't call the doctor, flashed through my mind, as well as Myrna's shriek when she hit Yara the night before. We killed her. You'll kill the rest of us. What I don't understand is why Myrna didn't call the doctor when Vesna was sick, and why Zednik and Yasna refused to call the doctor now. Yara starts to cry. Why don't you understand, father? Mommy made me think you were different. She made me think you'd be a friend, and I believed her. I wanted so much to believe her, but I couldn't go on believing her after I visited you in, the, in prison for the last time, when you told me you wouldn't have stopped them from taking Vesna away. I asked Zednik indignantly, Are you telling me Vesna wasn't sick either? Zednik answers, The only thing wrong with Vesna was that she grew up in this house between her sister, her mother, and her grandmother. Vesna wasn't sick, Yasna adds. She had rheumatic fever a few days earlier, but she'd recovered from that. I'm not an idiot either, I shout to Yasna. You're repeating Yara's comment like a parrot. If Vesna wasn't sick, why did she die? You are an idiot, Yara stan, Zednik shouts. Why can't you believe Yara? In the hospital, they didn't know what to make of Vesna. They misdiagnosed her. But that's impossible, I start to shake. Impossible, Zednik shouts. But you're as authoritarian as they come. Do you think doctors are gods? Hasn't Yara told you what they did to her? I couldn't tell him because he was on their side, Yara says. Tell him now, Yara. He has to be told sometime, y Yasna insists. They didn't even let Mommy and me go see her. They kept us in that front office where white-frocked people constantly ran in and out. They told me Vesna was asleep and couldn't be disturbed. We waited all day and half the night, but Vesna kept being asleep, and then I knew they were lying. Vesna didn't sleep all the time. When there wasn't anyone in the office, I left Mommy there and walked up and down the halls, which are the same as in school, only longer. I looked into every room until I found her in a room full of sick people. The doctors had all lied to us. Vesna was wide awake, staring at the ceiling, just like Mommy is. But I knew they were killing her. They had all kinds of tubes connected to her, in her arm, through her nose, and elsewhere. Poor Vesna couldn't breathe. I went up to her and told her, if you don't stop, they won't let you come out and see Father when he returns. She said, I've seen him, and I hate him. I asked her, do you want to stay here? She said, no, Yara, I hate it here. I hate all these people. I want to go back to Grandmother's room. I got mad at her and shouted, then stop pretending. Vesna said, I can't. I could have made her stop, but they didn't let me. Nurses and guards had heard me and came running for me. I screamed, you're killing her while they carried me to the waiting room, and then they told both of us to leave. They knew what they were doing to Vesna. How awful, Yasna sobs. I only learned about Yara's visit to Vesna this morning. All I knew before was what Titus had told me right after Vesna died. He had called the hospital every half hour to find out how she was, poor soul. He had taken her there, and he was so concerned. But he took the hospital authorities as seriously as you do. She was in a perpetual coma, he told me. They kept diagnosing and re-diagnosing her. Every diagnosis had had its tests and treatment. 
Poor Vesna just wasn't strong enough to withstand all those treatments. And all that time, Vesna succeeded in fooling them. How could she, I ask, on the verge of tears? Please don't be so stupid, Yarostan, Yasna sobs. How could Yara's sister, Myrna's daughter, herself an accomplished prankster, fool all those doctors and nurses? Children do that in school every day of the year. Not just to me, that's easy. Some fooled the entire teaching staff for months at a stretch. Those doctors authoritatively told Titus she was in critical condition, that she had a clot on the brain, and even that her brain was damaged, and they treated her for all of that. I can't hold back my tears. I reached both my hands out to Yara and beg, Please forgive me. I insulted you whenever you tried to tell me. You have a good reason to hate me. I was terribly wrong. Yara runs to me crying. Until today, it didn't matter how wrong you were, she whispers. You couldn't have helped us. You were in prison when they took Vesna away. I'm the one who could have helped, but I stayed away, and I continued staying away, Yasna sobs. Vesna had missed school for more than a week, but I didn't ask Yara what was wrong, and I didn't introduce myself to Myrna as her husband's and brother's friend. Instead, I told Titus that Vesna was probably ill, and it was he who rushed to your house. I satisfied myself with visiting vicariously through Titus. I knew that something was terribly wrong when he described Vesna's illness and Myrna's and Yara's reactions to it, but I still didn't come. Titus was convinced Vesna needed medical care, but he'd had no experience with imaginative children. He told me indignantly that Vesna never left the sick old woman's bed, and that when he walked into the room, the child repeated her grandmother's hocus-pocus about the devil and the charms with which to exorcise him. I should have known right then. I would have known if I'd seen her. Titus blamed Myrna for leaving the child in that bed, instead of having taken her to the hospital. He told me that when he mentioned the hospital, Myrna acted as insane as her mother, and Yara became hysterical. So he took it on himself to have Vesna taken to the hospital. And when she was carried to the ambulance, two attendants had to hold Yara and keep her out of the way. Myrna has every reason in the world to consider me a coward and a hypocrite. Where was I when Vesna was carried away? Myrna and not Yara needed me. Vesna might still be alive today. But I was home, reading. I couldn't share the real horrors with Myrna, not even one of them. She didn't blame you, Yasna. She blamed herself. And that was my fault, Yara tells her. Mommy tried to stop them from taking Vesna as much as I did. She begged them on her knees not to take her away from us. She cried all day long. We went to the hospital every day, even after they told us not to come anymore. Whenever anyone came out, we begged, please give our Vesna back to us. Twice we waited all day in the rain. A nurse kept running out and telling us to go home. She said we were crazy and called us stupid peasants. Finally, a man in a white coat led us into the waiting room, but only to tell us that Vesna wasn't in the hospital anymore. We screamed at him, and he had another man in a white coat come in to tell us she had died that morning in an ambulance while being transferred to another hospital. That was when I shouted, Mommy, you let them kill our Vesna. It wasn't true. I knew it wasn't true. But I wanted someone to blame because I loved Vesna. Mommy believed it. She blamed herself. For two weeks, she went to work crying, and she returned crying. I begged her to forgive me for saying that, but she never stopped blaming herself. One day, weeks after Vesna's death, I told her Vesna never would have started hating you and Mommy if that old woman hadn't been living with us, and that made her stop crying. That night she went to Grandmother's room and screamed, Vampire! You won! You've always wanted to take Vesna from me. You've done it. Your holy work is done. You can go now. Mommy had me stay home from school the next day. A heating stove arrived and a bed, as well as a load of bricks. She came home from work with a wheelbarrow and a mortar. That night we started building walls around the stove and bed. And every time she walked by Grandmother's room, she mumbled things like, You'll soon have a house without devils in it. And, Vesna should have helped me do this five years ago. You might have spared her your salvation. When we finished, the two of us carried the old woman to the new house. She was mainly bones and lighter than I. I laughed when Mommy sang, Holy Mary, Mother of God, we're taking you to heaven. No demons will ever share your house again except to feed you and remove your excrement. But she didn't stop blaming herself for Vesna's death, and when the old woman died after you came back, she blamed herself for that too. I wish I'd never told her she'd let them kill Vesna. Vesna's death was my fault more than anyone else's. Hugging Yara, I begged, don't say that, please. You love Vesna. You and Myrna did all you could to save her. I didn't love Vesna. I was afraid of her. I was sorry whenever she came instead of Myrna. I was even happy when Titus came instead of Vesna. I resented Vesna's hating me for being in jail. She sensed my feelings toward her. That must have had a terrible effect on her. Don't ever blame yourself for that, Yara. Your feelings had nothing to do with it, Yara says insistently. Vesna was playing a game with me and with no one else, and she won. A game, Yara? And Vesna won? A game, father. Why did those doctors have to come into it? Vesna hated the old woman as much as I did, but she pretended to love her. 
She loved you as much as I did, but she pretended to hate you. When we learned you'd return in a year, before Mommy and I went to see you, I caught her kissing herself in the mirror. I knew she was kissing you, and I forced her to admit it. She made me promise never to tell Mommy, and I never told. But I made fun of her until the day we went to visit you. I called her a liar for pretending to be like the crazy old woman. I told her I knew she wanted you to touch her and kiss her and sleep next to her. Yara started crying and continues through her sobs. I didn't tell her those things to be mean or to hurt her, but because I knew they were true. Vesna was my sister, not the old woman's. And she wasn't hurt when I told her those things. It was a game. She made her eyes real big, and she ran to the old woman's room, shouting, You'll roast in hell, Yara. She didn't hurt me any more than I hurt her. That was our game. And it was still just a game the day Mommy and I went to tell you about your release. Mommy was so happy. She got all dressed up. She looked beautiful. Vesna wanted to come with us. I know she did. But when, but when Mommy asked her, she said, You're the devil, all of you. I told her, So are you. Mommy and I were so happy when we got back, she showed me how you'd dance with me. We danced and played until Vesna came in and saw us. Mommy teased her the way I had, but Vesna just had to win. She had to prove I was wrong, that she wasn't the devil. Vesna froze, and even Mommy thought she was sick. Vesna made herself crazy, just like the old woman, and she wouldn't come out of the old woman's room. She sweated and then shivered, and Mommy got scared until I showed her I could do that too. Vesna had showed me, but that's when I should have stopped teasing Vesna before all those outsiders came to our house. The more I teased her about being the devil, the more she became like the old woman. And in the end, she won. Everyone believed her, starting with Mr. Zabram and those ambulance people who came for her. It was all my fault, not yours or Mommy's or anyone else's. I wish I hadn't forced her to play the game so hard, so long. All of us turned our heads abruptly when we hear Myrna sob. She's standing in the bedroom doorway, looking at the three of us huddled around Yara. She's crying. She walks toward us kneels in front of Yara, and throws her arms around her. Did you really see Vesna kiss herself in the mirror? Yara throws her arms around Myrna's neck and, kissing her on the lips, whispers, Like this, Mommy, it's the only way you can kiss in a mirror, and I know she wanted a boy in school to kiss her. You're not making it up? I swear, Mommy. Please don't call me that anymore. Mommy, why not? Because you're so much smarter than I am. Zenik is the only one without tears on his face. He gets up and exclaims, That was a nasty trick, Myrna. That whole elaborate performance just to get your daughter to admit her share of the guilt? You're smart too, father, Myrna whimpers. I'm the only idiot here. Zednik turns to Yara. Can I borrow that letter now? There are some things you didn't make very clear. Yara hands him your previous letter. He leaves the house shouting to Myrna. I want to find out who taught you to play such devilish games. Myrna moves towards Yasna. Her hand pushes her hair away from Yasna's face. Kissing Yasna's forehead, she asks, do you hate all the school children who fool you and play tricks on you? No, Myrna, I don't hate them, Yasna sobs. I love them more than any of the others, because they're alive. Will you forgive me? There's nothing to forgive, Myrna. Everything you said about me is true. Will you ever forgive me? Myrna wipes the tears from Yasna's face. Yarostan says you're very pretty when you smile, Yasna. Show me, please. Yasna smiles weakly. Myrna kisses her cheeks. Yasna hugs Yara and then hugs me. She leaves the house crying, but smiling. Myrna picks Yara up and carries her to the bedroom, asking in a whisper, What else did Vesna want? She wanted everything you and I wanted, Mommy. I mean, Myrna. If the old woman hadn't been staying with us, Vesna never would have been afraid of being touched. That came from thinking herself, the old woman, with that cold, bluish, wrinkled skin that was so disgusting to touch. If it hadn't been for the old woman, Vesna would have loved you and father. Can I call him Yarastan now? Maybe not the way Tissy loves Sophia. Not that way at all, but at least the way Sophia loves Sabina. I know. A few days later, when I return from work, Myrna throws her arms around me and starts to dance around the living room with me. She waves your most recent letter in the air. Yara shouts, She's on strike! I'm overwhelmed with joy. I spin Myrna around the room. Our crisis is over. Zednik and Yasna join us to celebrate your commune and Myrna's strike. We're finally together again, Yasna exclaims while reading your letter. We love you. Yarastan.